Welcome to Miked Up with CNBC's David Faber in conversation with U.S. House Financial Services Committee Chairman Jeb Henserling. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Eric Kaplan, the director of the Housing Finance Program within uh, the Center for Financial Markets for uh, the Milken Institute. Uh, my senior fellows and I, we engage with policymakers, thought leaders, and industry members in the drive to strengthen the U.S. housing market and the financial markets that support it. We're incredibly excited to bring you this morning a uh, special one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, about the future of housing finance reform with Congressman Jeb Henserling, who's chairman of the House Financial Services Committee and one of the leading voices in the housing finance reform effort over these last several years. Uh, we're in, it's just as excited that uh, this conversation will be led by award-winning journalist and uh, co-host and producer of uh, CNBC's Squawk on the Street, David Faber. So uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, uh, being here to talk about this incredibly important subject. So David, thank you and take it away. Of course I will. And it is an incredibly important subject, actually. One you've devoted a lot of time to. Are you disappointed that here we are and you're leaving Congress in the not too distant future and uh, Fannie and Freddie are still in conservatorship? The short answer is yes. <laughs> yes, I'm very disappointed. Uh, serving in Congress has been the greatest privilege of my life. Um, but I tell some friends I've never worked so hard to achieve so little. Uh, I haven't given up, I haven't thrown in the towel, but yeah, to be 10 years removed um, from really the epicenter of the financial crisis, which my view is, is an erosion of traditional prudent underwriting standards, and to still see so many aspects of the system still in place, yes, it's very worrisome. So um, I have a goal. Uh, I doubt we're going to get um, legislation uh, onto the president's desk in this Congress, but I do think it's important uh, that in addition to the uh, PATH Act that was passed in the 113th Congress, uh, before I leave, I'm working to establish kind of a bipartisan, bicameral uh, marker, and for a number of reasons we can get into. I, I think early in the next Congress is going to be a, a better opportunity. But given that housing and its uh, related aspects are almost 20 percent uh, of our economy, uh, given again that it was at the, how, uh, at the epicenter of the second worst financial crisis in our history, it, it's, it's just shameful. Shameful that in many respects we have left the same kind of legal and regulatory infrastructure uh, in place. And, and time is of the essence. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that we have a 3% plus uh, growth tax code. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, hopefully we will see 3% uh, plus economic growth, but we know that bad loans are made in good times. And so time is really of the essence to get this right. Yeah, so when you s use the word worrisome, I'm, curi I'm sort of curious as to what you're referring to specifically when you say that, that, that the current situation is worrisome. Well, it's worrisome in that, um, you know, still roughly, I think, 98, 99 uh, percent of all securitizations um, still are backed by the federal government. I think it's roughly 70 percent of... Uh, originations. Now, there are aspects of the market that have clearly been cleaned up. Um, you know, we're not seeing no doc loans. We're not seeing uh, money back uh, at the closing. Um, you know, some of the predatory practices uh, have been ended. But again, kind of the legal regulatory infrastructure <clears throat> that was there is still in place. You, we are still in a Fannie Freddie central government st centric. Uh, system and the taxpayers still are on the hook for roughly a trillion dollars of, of mortgage-backed uh, securities and so we're lacking competition, we're lacking innovation and we've centralized all the risk in one place and so the dynamic particularly of market discipline uh, is missing and I've always believed that that regulatory fiat is not a substitute uh, for market discipline, which I think a very common sense definition is having both the appearance and the reality of having your own money at risk. Um, so I still believe that at the end of the day, the body politic is going to demand uh, that you have a federal guarantee in the secondary mortgage market. Uh, I personally don't believe in it, but I'm really willing to accept it. But if we do it, we need to do it in a very thoughtful way, putting the taxpayer in the last loss position, a catastrophic loss position, and we need to disperse risk, diffuse it throughout the system as much as possible as opposed to centralize it 
into these kind of two failed models that we all know was kind of, you know, capitalism on the way up, socialism on the way down. Right. Well, uh, with the understanding that you've already said you don't expect legislation, obviously, move this Congress. Nonetheless, what are the tenets of legislation that you would sort of like to put in place now that you think will have bipartisan support that will provide the momentum perhaps in the next Congress to actually see something done here? Well, let me take the liberty of giving a shout out uh, to the Milken Institute because uh, the work that we are doing on the House Financial Services Committee, a lot of the scholarship, a lot of the leadership uh, has come from the Institute. Now, when we finally unveil the bill, we'll see if they still claim <laughs> any, uh, <laughs> any ownership of it. Uh, the devil is always in the details. So um, again, I, this is kind of a, a variant of, um, in the circles known as the DeMarco Bright Plan. So what are we trying to do here? Number one, we try to take as much of the current uh, Ginnie Mae infrastructure and processes and preserve that. But we would take the Ginnie Mae wrap uh, and put it over private label mortgage-backed securities that meet kind of an all new and improved qualified mortgage standard. Um, and um, we would attempt to, again, reinvigorate the private label NBS market. We would try to incent uh, financial institutions to be able to originate uh, and hold. Again, we would also separate the issuer function from the guarantor function. So if you think in terms of the capital stack, you would start off uh, obviously with the borrower's down payment, which we believe should be 5% and not 3%. And as an aside, again, when you say, what am I worried about, what am I concerned about? I mean, I currently see essentially Freddie and FHA on a race to the bottom, uh, now both doing 3% down. I think Freddie's doing 50% LTV. In many respects, I see us, you know, again, repeating the same mistakes of the past. So. We will debate the size of the credit box, but we believe we ought to at least start with 5% down, 85% LTV, so there will be a role uh, for, for PMI, uh, will be the second part of the stack. Um, every issuer will, make, will have to have loan level uh, credit enhancement from um, a, a guarantor entity. The guarantor would have to have bank-like uh, capital as defined and administered by FHFA. Uh, so next you would go uh, to the uh, guarantor who would charge uh, a guarantee fee. Uh, you would look at their balance sheet. Uh, from there, uh, there would be, for lack of a better term, a mortgage insurance fund um, that would be administered by FHFA. Um, and uh, then you would go to the issuer balance sheet. Last but not least, there is Jenny uh, and the taxpayer balance sheet. But the taxpayer essentially would be in a catastrophic position. What we're attempting to do is, and it may not make perfect economic sense, but when I look at, at, at having fought this battle for a number of years, trying to put the, as I mix metaphors here, put the political building blocks in place. I think the body politic will demand a, a, a preservation of the 30-year fixed mortgage. I personally don't think it is a great product for a lot of people, but who am I? So anyway, we think we have a system that preserves uh, and, and, and actually strengthens in many ways the 30-year fixed mortgage. We think it's important that the uh, cash window uh, remain open, so we are going to uh, in many respects, phase out the current Fannie and Freddie model, uh, not liquidate them, um, but eventually one of those uh, entities would end up um, also supplying, continuing to offer a cash window. We want to ensure that the federal home loan banks do the same thing, so we want our community financial institutions uh, to be able to access not one cash window, two cash window, continue to be able to keep their customer relationships. We think that's an important part uh, of the system uh, as, as well. Um, there are a number of things that we have to do to make it easier um, uh, to, um, I, I guess, reinvigorate, jumpstart our, our private label NBS market. Um, you know, there's the Basel LCR, uh, ratio, we 
doesn't account properly for non-recourse loans. Um, there is concern how uh, Reg AB2 will end up impacting uh, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, I didn't mention it, but the guarantor is going to have to do credit risk transfer. Right now, REITs cannot participate in that credit risk transfer. So in talking to market participants, uh, we've come up with, I don't know, a dozen, 15 different provisions we think are necessary, and some of which I will admit does, does touch upon Dodd-Frank. But the whole idea is, again, to rein, reinvigorate a private label NBS market. And, um, you know, I think Jenny currently has something like 400 different issuers now. So, again, we want that risk more diffused. Uh, we would see a number of guarantors that arise here. So, hopefully, at the end of the day, we institute some market discipline. Uh, we keep the most politically favored aspects of the system in place now. Um, and um, we are hoping that this would meet the criteria of the body politic. With one other thing, we know that, uh, as we say in Washington, my friends on the other side of the aisle, when we say that occasionally, we actually mean it. So uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle are going to insist on some type of affordable housing program on top of the roughly 100 means-tested affordable housing programs we already have on the books. Uh, I'm willing to accept that, but I will insist that it be on budget and demonstrably it has to help the people, actually help the people uh, who are low and moderate income. So could that be premium support of some type? Could it be increased Section 8 vouchers? A number of different ways. I'm looking for my Democratic colleagues to tell me, how do we fill in this space? I'm willing to do the government guarantee. I'm willing to do the affordable housing piece but I want risk diffused, I want market discipline, I want competition, and I want the taxpayer in the last loss position. Well, just listening to you and the level of complexity that some legislation like this involves, and obviously, as everything does, the compromise it's going to require from both sides of the aisle, I mean, what can you put in any sort of a probability on whether or not you'll actually see something similar to what you just described emerge in the next Congress? Well. I'm a legislator, not a Vegas bookie, so I don't quite know how to put probability factor on it. I would say this, at least anybody I deal with in the marketplace, I don't think anybody believes the current system is sustainable. And um, if I had one watchword, it would be sustainability. Sustainable for the economy, sustainable for taxpayers, but in some respects, most important, sustainable for homeowners. I mean, it's just tragic. Tragic that the body politic helped put people into homes they couldn't afford to keep. I, I mean, the number of lives that were ruined because of that. So I'm, I'm, I think there's at least some consensus that mistakes were made, that the system is not um, uh, sustainable. I do believe this. What I've told my Democratic colleagues is, listen, you got a choice here. Um, we're open for business. Come, let us reason. We'll negotiate. And by the way, if you choose not to negotiate, please know you've accepted the risk of having Donald J. Trump control housing finance for a minimum of five years and potentially 10 years. Now, is that a risk you want to take? If it is, take it. So um, the president gets to appoint a new FHFA director in January of 2019. And that FHFA director has in plenary powers over housing finance. So they can ratchet up G fees, they can ratchet down conforming loan limits, they can cut off any further uh, contributions uh, to the affordable housing uh, trust fund, and particularly sweeping powers as conservator. Um, they can almost, almost, it's an exaggeration, but they could almost shut down Fannie and Freddie if they so choose. So um, I'm hopeful um, that uh, at that point, uh, the president will be able to get the attention of my colleagues. And listen, some, some, some are interested in, in doing this. Uh, but I don't know what probability factor to, to put on it, but I do think that opportunity will come uh, early in the next Congress, and I hope that we lay the proper foundation in this Congress, because a number of members who've been active, like Senator Corker, um, um, Chairman Royce, 
um, John Delaney from the other side of the aisle. A lot of us are leaving Congress. Right. And so, again, I, I have a goal uh, to lay down this bipartisan, bicameral marker that could serve as a foundation when I think that opportunity will come early in the next Congress. Um, specific to sort of the plans for the private MBS market um, and what I think you said would be increased competition and innovation in terms of providing more choice. I mean, some of us can obviously remember not, it is some time ago, but 05, 06 time period, and a lot of our friends from Irvine, California that no longer have businesses that did all of those things. How do you safeguard um, that which we do potentially need, that growth and innovation, uh, in that private market without taking us down a road that we certainly don't want to go down again? Well, essentially, you make the choice to securitize prime mortgages. That's what you agree to securitize. That's what's going to be uh, backed up with the taxpayer backstop. So you have to define what is the credit box going to look like. And then, you know, it's, it's the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, the price of a stable sustainable housing market is also going to be eternal vigilance because you know the political pressures as time goes by, I've seen this movie before, is again, bring down conforming loan uh, limits, bring down uh, G fees, enlarge, enlarge the credit box. Uh, but again, we believe very strongly um, uh, in assessing the data that a minimum of 5% down uh, is necessary. Uh, QM, um, you know, has given us a 43% uh, DTI. Um, you know, we have to look at what credit score. Uh, in some respects, I hate to necessarily chisel this in stone, but I think the broad parameters uh, of a QM can be established in statute. But the thought is, again, make sure that you're securitizing prime mortgages only. Okay, and who is the relevant regulator there if, in fact, we do see the reemergence of this private market in a significant way to make sure those standards are being adhered to? Well, we would keep in our legislative construct FHFA um, as the uh, relevant uh, regulator. And again, Ginny determines um, who becomes an issuer. Um, and again, we want to ensure that our guarantors have the equivalent of bank-like capital. Uh, in order to be a guarantor within the system. Um, the conservatorship's still in place. The sweep of profit's still in place, correct? Right? I mean, there were lawsuits against the so-called Third Amendment. They went nowhere a number of years ago from hedge funds who actually thought they had a real case to be made. Is there an element of this, especially given the level of our deficits right now, where you're going to get some pushback in terms of reforming Fannie and Freddie? Because even though the All numbers I've are not as big, it's still nice to get something coming in. All I've known is pushback. So that's nothing new to my particular uh, avocation. Um, again, I think the um, contingent liability that is on the books, uh, I mean, according to the Congressional Budget Office, the taxpayer is on the hook for 100 cents on the dollar. So whatever that number is, 8.2 trill, 8.3 uh, trill. Uh, between Fannie, Freddie, uh, Ginny. You're talking real money there, I think, yeah. You're talking yeah. real money. So I, I, I think the case that I obviously make to the fiscal conservatives, um, which unfortunately is a rather shrinking caucus in the United States Congress, is that uh, right now we've got the taxpayer on the hook for 100 cents on the dollar, which leads to moral hazard. And any, any private capital that we could put in front of that taxpayer capital, ultimately, on long term, is going to be able to uh, lessen the fiscal implications uh, that currently take place on our housing market. And the loss to our economy, again, for the second, what is it, 15, 16, 17 trillion dollars that were lost through the financial crisis. And again, if you believe that ultimately it was the erosion of traditional prudential underwriting standards, you, you, you want to solve the problem. And um, if you do, it will have a far more uh, benevolent impact on the, on the federal fisc. You'd indicated, I think, uh, moments ago in some of your comments uh, that if there's been a decrease in standards uh, that you're starting to see in terms of underwriting. Well, again, yeah. So I think it's Freddie and, and both FHA are now uh, allowing 3% down. Um, 
what so is that is that? Just I mean, it's it's not necessarily a market-related function there in terms of them being pushed to do it as they might have been previously. So why, why is that happening? Well, isn't that a good question? Where's Mel Watt when you need him to um, ask him these questions? So uh, FHA has an outsized role. I haven't looked at the numbers recently. Traditionally, FHA has been about 15% of the market. I still think now they're closer to maybe 35, maybe 40% of the market. The lights are too bright, so I can't see the nodding heads in the audience to see if I have the, that data point right. So my fear is part of this is, is uh, market share. And um, listen, nothing, nothing personal. I've served in Congress with Mel Watt, and I, I really, really like the, the gentleman. But he is, he's taking Fannie and Freddie, particularly their common securitization platform, inward. And his predecessor, Ed DeMarco, was making it outward facing so that he, DeMarco was laying the groundwork for the legislation that we're trying to do. And unfortunately, I, I think Mr. Watt is laying the predicate for reestablishing a Fannie Freddie centric model. And so there, I think, again, to some extent, it's a race for market share on the taxpayer's dime, and this, this, this cannot be allowed to go on. So as we start to, or those of us in the media who will follow this and others uh, in the investment community and, and, and elsewhere, who should we be looking to as the champions in the next Congress of many of the things that you're talking about? I'm here, I'm asking particular people who are going to pick this up from you uh, on both sides of the aisle conceivably. Well, isn't that a good there. question? <laughs> I'm not sure I quite have a good answer uh, yet. Um, but I think there's a number of people in the House Financial Services Committee who will uh, who'll take up this mantle. Um, Are there Lane Luca Meyer from, from, yeah. from Missouri is very knowledgeable about this. Bill Huizinga from Michigan is very knowledgeable about it. I'm also talking about two people who have announced that they do wish to be candidates to be considered as the next chairman of the House Financial Services um, Committee. But yeah, it's, 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 it's disappointing. It's been a, a, a a goal of mine. I thought there was an opportunity uh, at one point, um, particularly when we passed our bill out in the 113th Congress. Unfortunately, it took the Senate almost another year. And once you get into the election year, it's very challenging to do, um, it's difficult to do bipartisan legislation, unfortunately impossible to do heavy lifts like GSE reform. Um, I talked to Secretary Geithner at, at, at the time. I think he was very interested in pursuing this. I know he was. Um, I saw no interest whatsoever in his successor, Secretary Liu, in pursuing this. Um, I'm optimistic. Um, I know that our current Secretary of Treasury, Mnuchin, this is, he has a lot of expertise in this area. I think, um, again, they have the ability to do so much administratively once they get in a new FHFA director. Um, but I think for the sake of the marketplace, we need greater certainty than five-year certainty or even 10-year certainty. Um, so there'll be some champions in the House. You'd probably have to ask Senator Corker, who's been one of the real champions in the Senate, who's going to take this up in his um, absence. Yeah. Uh, and what if control of the House passes to the Democrats? And obviously, there's a chairman of your committee who's no longer of your party. Is that going to change significantly what you're talking about? It would seem it might. Uh, I think it would radically change it, but um, that is a rather partisan perspective. But yeah, I'm just not seeing a lot of current interest, well, um, with a few exceptions, and some of those Democratic members are getting ready to, to leave Congress. Again, I think a lot of them are interested in the affordable housing component, and that's why I say, bring me your plan. Mm -hmm. Bring me your plan. And um, I'm willing to do the government guarantee. I'm willing to do an affordable housing program. But we need to have risk dispersal. We need taxpayers in the um, uh, final loss position, last loss position. And when you look at the overall structure right now and where we are in the financial markets, given you are, you're also a student of sort of the, the broader markets as well, uh, and the fact that you're going to be a private citizen come about eight months from now, what, what worries you the most? What is most concerning to How you? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> we have four minutes. Um, I guess what worries me most broadly is that I, I, I really believe that due to the president's leadership, the speaker's leadership, we now have a 3% growth tax policy. 
I fear we do not have a 3% growth regulatory policy. And to achieve long-term 3% economic growth, I think we're going to need both. And I don't know this for a fact, but I think it is probably unparalleled in the history of mankind to have a nation that has achieved 3% plus growth for over 200 years, which America has. In many respects, it's our birthright. And as I look at the data, in, particularly in the, in the post-war era, 3% plus growth is a real line of demarcation. If you look at poverty reduction, if you look at increases in income, if you look at job creation, almost 80% of that occurs in the 3% plus growth years. So not only it is our birthright, our heritage, I, I, I believe it is part of our destiny. The bottom line is we're not there. And so I'm, when I look at the fact that the Senate still has their, essentially their supermajority rules in place for most banking and capital markets reform, um, I'm not exactly terribly optimistic of how do we get to this long-term 3% growth. Tax reform could be passed with a simple majority. It takes a supermajority to do banking uh, and, and capital formation reform. And so I sometimes fear that, um, um, that our, we're losing the rule of law to the discretion of regulators, which kind of undermines a very foundational democratic principle. Uh, as I was joking with you on the way in, I'm not sure that a GS6 at the FDIC doesn't have more power than the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. And I have to face the voters every two years, and they don't. And so, and then I see the Fed, uh, you know, in boardrooms of our major financial institutions essentially getting involved in corporate governance issues as opposed to prudential regulatory issues. And so I have a great fear that you know, we're in a long-term process that would turn um, essentially our major financial institutions into the functional equivalent of utilities so that politicians could allocate credit to politically favored classes. So I have that fear as well. Um, we don't have time, but um, we're spending money we do not have, and nations that have a national debt that's you know, 100% of GDP, bad things happen. Having said all of that, compared to the fact that my 16-year-old daughter just got her driver's license, all of that cannot compare to the fear I have of having a new driver in my family. Well, Chairman Hensterling, we'll leave it on that uh, upbeat note. I'm not sure. Um, but you asked. I did, uh, but we certainly appreciate you taking some time and your insights. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the audience as well.